two guys. We are ready. Introduce you guys. Kelly's got the same background as I, I have, except but we needed a we need she needed to create her own studios. So All right, why don't we get started so that way we have plenty of time and that way we have some um, maybe some Q&A uh, if folks want to ask some questions. So uh, this is Dr. Joe Lazama, Vice Chair of Education, uh, bringing you another University of South Florida Grand Rounds, Department of Internal Medicine, Roy Benke Grand Rounds. So I am broadcasting from the It Med Flix Studios. That's our new name for our Grand Round Studios. Thank you for all of the wonderful messages from last week's Grand Rounds. It seemed to have gone viral. I'm already scheduled to give that Grand Rounds at two other medical universities in the next three months, and I have invitations for five others. Uh, so somehow they, I guess they're looking at the YouTube or they got heads up and they looked at the YouTube and I've gotten the request to go, which is great because we really provide outstanding education here. So I wanted to share with you that our talks are viral in nature. We are very blessed to have this week a University of South Florida Internal Medicine Residency Program update, introducing our three speakers very briefly. So start with our program director, Kelly Aller. Dr. Aller took over for Dr. Cook Mai in 2019, I think, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. I think 18. 18, wow, it's a <laughs> season. Took over in 2018. Kelly Aller is truly, and Dr. Altus and I went over this, truly the fifth program director, if you will, in USF internal medicine history. When you're talking about almost 50 years, that's an incredible run. A lot of program directors last a year to a year and a half, two years in these very difficult times. Uh, but Roy Benke, our founding chair of internal medicine, served functionally as the program director the first several years until Phil Altus, who gave a morning report new slash noon conference yesterday. He took over about 1980 and served in almost 25 years, followed by Dr. Michael Flannery, uh, may he rest in peace, who followed in the next nine years uh, and for which the B107 conference room is named at Tampa General, then uh, followed by Dr. Cook Mai, who is our uh, head of GME, and Cook does an outstanding job of keeping all of our educational programs in perfect shining order. And then Kelly Aller took over. So Kelly Aller, who is a USF -er forever college, med school, residency, faculty years. I first met Kelly when she was my treasurer of my internal medicine interest group, of which Kelly says, I can't even remember that, Joe. So Kelly did a great job as treasurer. I said, clearly these are program director qualities. I didn't call it that early, but Dr. Aller went on to be a Jeopardy champion as a student, a Jeopardy national champion as a student, national, uh, almost national champion as a resident, but state champion numerous times, as you guys saw from last week's Grand Rounds, and joined our faculty in 2012. And so in that short time, she's been program director nearly half of her years on faculty, has done an amazing job of keeping our program vibrant and has been a role model for tons of residents and also a role model for us as faculty to emulate as a teacher and as a mentor. Uh, the other folks that will be speaking today, Eli Maris Perez Colon. So you have to say it the right way. Eli Maris, Eli Maris Perez Colon uh, is a medicine pediatrics <laughs> graduate who's been in our faculty for, I think, almost a decade now. I think it's a decade. Eli Maris, have you hit the Big Ten? 11. 11, so she passed the 10. So Ellie Maurice uh, was part of Dr. Cookmai's first graduating residency class, if memory serves correct. I still remember the picture with all of us with Pete Chang that I wore the blue shirt, this blue shirt, exact blue shirt. <laughs> I just remember now. Uh, so I could stand out a little bit. But Ellie Maurice has been an outstanding faculty member. And you will hear a lot of her efforts on diversity, inclusion, and equity today as part of this talk. And finally, uh, last but not least, Harold Paul, who I stole away from Bay Pines with one foot almost in the door at Bay Pines to make sure that he stayed at the James A. Haley VA Hospital. Harold is uh, one of our youngest faculty member leaders, but still, even with that youth, he is incredibly capable, incredibly skilled, 
doing a fantastic job as now co-associate program director at the VA, along with Jeff Cummings. Uh, Harold has also been instrumental in our diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts, and is becoming just an absolutely well-rounded clinician leader. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Aller to run through our residence, internal medicine residency program update. And I will be listening intently because I was a resident here, in case folks don't know, I was a resident here from 97 to 2000, and I, can I, I can't be any prouder of this internal medicine program. And I am the megaphone whenever I go to national meetings of how great this program is. And these three people are a <laughs> huge reason why this program continues to shine. So Dr. Aller, take it away. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And we're also gonna be joined in the second half by a lot of our leader, resident leaders on DICE too. Um, so jumping in, uh, today we're gonna kind of give an overview of the accomplishments from the, actually more the 2022-2023 season. Um, so, and some new things that have spilled into this year, new initiatives. We're gonna talk about some recruitment data and also some exciting things that are hot off the presses for recruitment next year nationally. And then in the second half, uh, our DICE committee, our Diversity, Inclusion, and Community, Community Engagement Committee is gonna talk about a lot of the initiatives and accomplishments that they've had um, in the years. So just some highlights. Um, our program size, and I've only included back to about 2008 or so, has really blossomed in the last decade plus. Um, we've sat at our complement or just at it for the last three years. Um, a lot of that's been also due to the growth of our prelim program. Uh, running through a little bit more data, so our graduates last year, and uh, this usually kind of holds true for each um, graduating class with a little bit over half going into fellowship. Uh, we had a large group going into primary care this year, right? So almost a quarter of our residents went into primary care. Uh, the vast majority stay in Florida in, in, uh, or across Florida, uh, but almost all of those, right? So 59% stay within our system somehow. Um, so in our fellowship programs, in our chief years, um, in our hospital or, or ambulatory systems at, at um, one of our many affiliate sites. Um, so I think this is a testament too to some of, I think, the uh, environment um, that's cultivated here that it really pulls in our residents um, when they graduate to want to kind of stay um, nearby residency training, just like I did a decade ago. Um, a recap of last year's scholarship. Uh, so we had 77 total presentations, with the majority of these being national conference presentations, uh, 63 peer-reviewed publications, and when you include the abstract publications, it's a little over 107 total publications that our residents did um, within the last academic year. So this is actually 22-23. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, our board success. Um, so super proud of our residents and um, grateful for our faculty for all they do to help prepare our residents for the boards. Uh, you can see this is the NRMP's data that they give the program. So they report out um, three years of data at a time. Um, so these are our rolling three-year board pass rates, which we've stayed very consistent, 99, 98, um, and the national average over the last three years for this three-year rolling pass rate has actually gone down. Um, so the last year it was an 86% um, program pass rate. This slide, I want to highlight some of the initiatives that the program has launched. And this is not all inclusive. You know, every time I've popped in the PowerPoint, it's like, oh, I need to add this bubble or that bubble. Um, so there's so many different initiatives that were started um, for this academic year. So a lot of these were built out of last spring's town halls, PECs. Um, as you guys know, we have done um, our first out of four resident town halls in the academic half day, and we had our PEC yesterday. So our committee is already in the works of brainstorming a lot of fun and different kind of initiatives um, for the upcoming year. Um, so just to highlight a few, right, for our interns, ACLS and BLS 
um, kind of prep and assessment was done at and added to our intern kind of orientation. Um, we added more case conferences um, to our teams on board so that um, we increased kind of that clinical reasoning discussion. Uh, our program participated um, with several other programs in the um, Usher's Patient Safety GME wide initiative. Um, and so through this program, by having safety huddles monthly at the start of intern orientation, we saw a lot more incident reporting. Um, and a lot of these incident reports led to actionable changes um, at the institution. Uh, the VA started a RIC system um, to kind of have as many teams as possible focused on learning during conference. It started a new rotation at Moffitt called the hospitalist rotation that also integrated in the night float. Um, so it got rid of a cross cover um, throughout the year. We built out the intern cross cover and sick full schedule at the start of the year. So our interns knew as soon as they got their schedule, you know, when their, I think, two to three cross covers were, when their sick full months were. Um, the new bed tower at the VA opened up. Uh, we transitioned um, the uh, Morsani and Health Park Quality Improvement Didactics. We transitioned to QGenda for scheduling and Thalmus for our interview day um, scheduling. We launched the on-the-spot evaluations last year um, for the clinic block and electives. So we had just under 700 feedback moments that were submitted by residents from those rotations. So really nice initiative that allowed us to get more and to you to have more feedback as well. Um, so these are something that our clinical competency committee reviewed, things that I reviewed for writing letters of recommendation. A side effect of this intervention that we didn't really anticipate was it actually gave us a lot of a lot more data on faculty. Um, so when you guys submitted that form, right, you're on the spot form and you gave reciprocal feedback to the rotation and to the faculty, it actually gave us a lot more um, faculty feedback data. So each year at the end of the year, we compile feedback for our faculty. And if they have at least three evaluations and new innovations, they would get a letter saying, here's your evaluations. Thank you so much. Um, and so this year, after having the feedback from the on the spot that you submitted, we had annual letters to write for almost 300 faculty members. Um, so it really gave us an opportunity to give a lot more reciprocal feedback um, to faculty that are working with you um, and allowed us to get feedback from faculty that weren't traditionally in our new innovation system for us to kind of send um, an evaluation to. We also use this feedback data and updated our annual kind of faculty feedback letter. Um, so we made it really multi-pronged, include including um, times that our faculty members gave lectures, how they integrated or helped with our interview season. Um, obviously, their evaluation feedback data. Um, so we had a whole host of different things that um, we gave feedback to for our faculty uh, with that change. Um, we had our inaugural community day that um, our DICE committee led. Obviously, you'll probably be hearing about this a bit more in the second half. Um, we increased subspecialty didactics. Um, each specialty um, was assigned uh, a subspecialty education coordinator, an SEC. And so, again, we pulled feedback um, that was specialty specific. So we pulled feedback from, you know, for example, rheumatology form, um, the rheumatology um, data from the ITE, the rheumatology data from our end of the year survey, from our ACGME survey plus the on-the-spot feedback that you submitted regarding those rotations, we all put into an evaluation again at the end of the year to give um, our subspecialty education coordinators. We also utilize this as an opportunity to um, help with another initiative, which was increasing our subspecialty um, noon conference series, trying to get back a bit more to pre-pandemic levels. Our Moffitt Day Assist Rotation transitioned to an intern role to really help our interns get more admitting um, opportunities at Moffitt before transitioning into that senior role. Um, and then that also integrated in the house officer cross cover. Um, so all of the cross covers at Moffitt disappeared this year because they were all um, naturally integrated into rotations. 
Um, I want to thank and and introduce, you know, some of our new faces um, in different kind of leadership aspects. So Chantal joined us this year on our program leadership side. Um, for our associate program directors, you'll see some fresh faces here. So Dr. Kapadia became one of our APDs for Tampa General. Dr. Navarte and Dr. Aponte are going to be our APDs for the Health Park and Morsani sites. I want to introduce our PGY3 chief residents for next year. Um, and so this was, it's always a tough choice um, and something that we take into account feedback from our CCC, um, peer nominations, um, uh, but we're super excited. Um, and then I don't have them on this slide, but obviously our current PGY3 um, chiefs, you know, very thankful for your um, leadership this year. Our PGY4 chief residents um, at the VA. And so officially announcing them here, although uh, the decisions made made for a while, so I'm sure a lot of you already know um, our fourth year chiefs. So now I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about um, kind of some changes in recruitment. And obviously there's been a lot of different changes that have been brewing over the last four seasons or so, right? I think four years ago, we went to an all virtual platform. Um, the next season, they added in um, the supplemental ARIS application and started program signaling with five signals at that time and geographic signaling. The following year, they integrated that supplemental application into ARIS for internal medicine. They increased the signaling up to seven. This year, they kept the signaling at seven, uh, but they really changed Again, the ARIS application um, that the applicants submit, kind of limiting things down to um, 10 experiences. So each year there's always, I feel like in the last few years, it's been a lot of moving parts um, in terms of recruitment. Um, so this is a number of applications to our categorical program. So taking out those that apply to our prelim program. This is the number of students that we interviewed. We actually went down a bit this year by about 30 students. Um, just because I think the program signals the last two years really allowed us to target applicants who had, um, I think, more of a, a true interest um, for our program. And we had 29 faculty interviewers. This shows the number of applications to our program over the last five years. Um, so this is actually a pandemic year technically pre-pandemic, because um, it would have um, really hit February, March, I think spring break, right? It's when everything shut down, it didn't open back up. Um, so it's interesting that there was a dip here ahead of that. This is the first year um, post-pandemic, the first virtual interview season. Um, so I think that explains definitely a big bump there. But even outside of that, there's still been gradual increases in the amount of applications to the categorical program throughout the years. Um, this is some data that ARIS released regarding last year's application cycle with the, with the pro, uh, program signals. So last year was the first year of seven. Um, this, they broke it down by um, program type. Um, so on average, university-based programs received about 344 um, program signals. The range was very large. I think I have another chart coming up of that. These are our program signals over the last three years. So this is when there was five, this is when there were seven, and then this is when there was seven this year. Um, again, this is just our categorical program pulling out um, the prelims. So we're really kind of right, um, this is the data from the year that I showed. Um, so really kind of right on par with the national average for community-based, I mean, university-based programs. Uh, but this will be changing in the upcoming year. Um, so why do program signals matter? So again, this is last year's data. If you look at everybody that applied to our program, only really a quarter had some sort of a, a visible tie that we could see. Right, a, maybe a visiting student, a USF student, or somebody that sent us a signal. Of those that, <clears throat> so this doesn't include everybody, um, but this includes those that are uh, at a really uh, very favorable position of matching. Um, 
within our uh, interview season last year. Um, so you can still see that we interviewed over a third of applicants who didn't send us a signal. Um, we still reviewed a large portion of obvious ties. But those that matched, um, only 12% of those that matched didn't have kind of one of those discrete signals. Um, so I think this kind of just graphically represents maybe why on the program side that the signaling or some sort of tie like that is helpful. Um, it helps programs better align their resources for the interview season to applicants that might have a higher propensity for um, ranking or evaluating. Obviously, I think there's definitely caveats to that. I think some medical schools might get advice, right, to be like, you're in Florida, they're in Florida, you know, don't use your signals in the state, kind of use them elsewhere. Um, I think each year, kind of the guidance in terms of do you signal your home program or not, you know, changes here and there. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of variety in the way individuals use signals. The signals, I think, can help Again, open the door for interviews, but even individuals who didn't signal sometimes throughout the interview season could maybe identify a program that they really liked that wasn't on their radar when they were kind of looking through programs over the summer to kind of figure out how to utilize their signals. <clears throat> so this is hot off the press. Um, the uh, American Journal of Medicine published um, kind of an AIM consensus statement about the upcoming um, application season and the changes that are going to be brewing from it. This caused a big, big stir. stir on our um, listserv for internal medicine program directors and program leadership. Um, they, it was a little bit contentious. How can you write a consensus statement? We've never heard about these initiatives. What are you going to do for this, that, or the other? We actually had a town hall this week. And they doubled down. They're like, it's happening. We're going with this. Um, and so this was some of the things that was in this perspective piece. Um, that the application process is increasingly efficient, stressful, and costly for both applicants and programs. Um, you can see that even with kind of adding in geographic signaling and program signals, that the even from our perspective, right, the number of applications that we're getting is just still increasing year to year. Um, and so kind of those excessive applications or excessive interviewing can be a bit harmful. I think the virtual interview season perhaps also lends itself to ease of interviewing, right? You could, you got 20 interviews, you're like, hey, I can make 20 interviews work. Um, whereas in a pre-virtual setting, right, you kind of had a natural, natural barriers to, to not interview as much. So there's three things that this perspective piece proposed. Number one was increasing the program signals to 15 instead of the seven, uh, using a tiered signaling system. So of those 15, three would be gold, um, where the applicants could say, I really like you. You're not just one of 15, you're one of three. Um, and then they would have 12 sig silver signal um, to still showcase interest to more programs than they could in the years past with the seven, seven, or the five. Um, I think most controversial um, was setting a cap of 15 interviews per applicant. Um, so this past year, um, they had an arrangement with Thalmus where programs could use Thalmus for free to try it out and they kind of set it up like it's coming the following year. So if you want to get used to it now, you can do it for free. Um, so I would imagine that uh, that transition to Thalmus is how they would accomplish number three, right? Because otherwise, historically, internal medicine programs has used a variety of scheduling software. We used to use Interview Broker. There's Thalmus. I know the MedPeds program, Kelly Paulina, likes to just call you on the phone. Um, there's a whole host of different ways, right? So there would be no way nationally for, for ARIS or any other body to kind of track how many interviews an applicant actually had. Um, so going to a single mo a single system um, for those interview invitations would accomplish that. Um, they also are working on you know a method that applicants can use to kind of better assess fit, um, and so they're encouraging programs to use um, this process. 
So again, this was their recommendations one and two, having gold and silver signals. <clears throat> this is the um, compa compatibility index um, that programs can fill out that resident or applicants can then utilize to see if it's a program that um, would best align with them, either in terms of what they're looking for or maybe the type of applicant they are. Um, and some of the reasons behind doing this tiered signaling process. So of those, you know, our, the average for um, university-based programs is around 350, but this was the spread. Some programs in total got five signals. Some programs got over a thousand. And so they wanted a method to help all types of programs better utilize signals, right? So if there's a tiered system, then programs that get a ton of signals could preferentially say, I'm going to look at just the gold ones first, right? And then maybe move on to the silver. And programs who get maybe a lower level of signals where it doesn't really help them tease out of their, you know, perhaps thousands of applications who's truly interested um, by giving applicants more signals, in theory, they should also get more signals, hopefully back um, that year. So this was some of um, the data that they used um, to kind of go towards this tiered signaling model. Um, and then the recommendation number three was again, that interview cap of 15 interviews per applicant, um, saying that uh, DO and MD students on a, about 75% of them match within their top three. Um, and having, I think, 10 um, ranks on their rank list conferred almost a near 100% um, matching. I think nationally, some of the dialogue from us around this is, you know, is this going to be harmful to perhaps those doing mm -hmm. a couples match? And um, they uh, are they tie kind of a, a timed start to the interview season of November 1st, because that way they want applicants to not necessarily go on a lot of interviews and then get later interviews that they really wanted. And maybe they were already at their interview cap because they've done 15. So in this model, before they could accept another interview, if they were already at 15, they'd have to decline something that they already had scheduled. So I think this aspect of the perspective piece um, was definitely a, a little bit more of uh, controversial in the last kind of week or two discussions since this came out. And so with that, I'm going to pause, um, switch gears to our um, DICE committee, and then uh, let's just do questions probably in total at the end. All right. We're going to go right into it, and we wanted to make this a little bit more interactive. So I'm going to ask um, that you participate in telling us what is diversity, equity, and inclusion to you? We're all about community, so we want to hear from you. Couple of words. Yes. Perfect. That's great. Right. Anyone else? All right. Great. Well, we are going to uh, dissect these three different words um, individually. And I think, you know, diversity uh, being the first one is exactly what you just said, right? So it's about accepting and celebrating that our differences are really what strengthen our teams. And um, though we, we actually have more similarities than differences, it is our differences that make us special, unique, and really bring innovation to our community. Equity um, is all about opportunity. And it's very different from equality, in which is, there is sort of the implication of everyone is going to get the same tool set in spite of having different skill sets, which doesn't quite work, right? So equity requires awareness, it requires empathy, it requires listening to our community, it requires um, having that 
introspection and that purpose. It really requires understanding each individual needs so we can give you the, the tool set that works for you. And inclusion is our uh, most important word and really is the reason why we created DICE in the first place. Inclusion to us is about belonging. It's about the individual understanding that he, she, or them is a very important part of our community puzzle. And most of our initiatives that we're going to go through really have to do with the piece of equity and inclusion. So we're going to talk about that. Can everybody hear me OK? All right, and just yes. for context, Dr. Paul and me, Cassie, are at the VA, so we're just floating voices, but we're here with the VA people. Um, but along those lines, who is involved in DICE? Even though the three of us are kind of standing up here as the faces, really we want to emphasize that DICE is about all of us working together as a community. So it's including residents, it's including staff, it's including attendings, you know, everything in between, um, as well as our like communities, our families, the people around us. This is a totally non-exclusive, you know, entity, and that's what we want to emphasize throughout these slides, which hopefully you'll see. So we also wanted to give a perspective in regards to how DICE came about. So this actually kind of goes back a few years. So in the fall of 2019, we were able to have a meeting with different shareholders of the department. Um, so actually that meeting was initiated because there was a video that I wanted to propose in regards to diversity and how diverse we were. And the question came up, well, are we really diverse as an institution or as a program? Um, and so a lot of these initiatives are coming directly from that uh, initial meeting. That's how we formulated DICE. And also too, we're mainly talking about the residency program, but this also encompasses the department overall. So just think about the three affiliated hospitals that we have at USF. Um, and look at the people who is around there, the attendings and different services. And so is there a, an ample amount of Black or African-American representation? Do you feel that people are open and comfortable as far as the LGBTQ plus to just be out there? Is there a nice representation as far as your Latinx or Hispanic, or is there equal representation regards women? So me personally, when you look at the three different hospitals, there's not that much representation in regards to your Black faculty members. And more specifically, when you look at your Black males, I'm the only one that's within three hospitals. And so if you're not aware about that, you should be, because this is the community and the people who are teaching you, and then you go back in Tampa, that's supposed to be very diverse. Um, I'm personally very fortunate to have an institution, especially more specifically the VA, as far as different bosses that really do care in regards to diversity amongst our hospice group. Because if you look at our group here, we're fairly diverse, but we still have a long ways to go. I'm also very fortunate to have a program director that is very open and encourages us to continue our efforts. And also with Dr. Mai and GME, she certainly encourages all of that. And so as we have been going throughout the uh, past few years in 2020 and 2021, uh, we initially started with our virtual recruitment. This is all within the midst of the pandemic. So we were specifically looking at our historically black colleges and universities and also our schools in mainland Puerto Rico. Um, we also initiated our affinity groups in which these are groups for uh, subsets from the larger population that kind of look at shared commonalities or uh, common uh, backgrounds. And so we initiated with our Black and African American group. And then as we continue on throughout the years, we started to expand amongst our virtual recruitment sessions. Uh, we started to kind of have a little bit more of an enhancement in regards to our admissions committee and try to really make it more inclusive and holistic overall. We've been able to also expand amongst our affinity groups. So that's when we added our Latinx and um, Hispanic group and then also our LGBTQ plus group. And then we start to do different events throughout the years. Um, last academic uh, um, year, we were able to increase more in regards to our virtual recruitment sessions, look more specifically at medical sc uh, schools that have associates, associations with LGBTQ plus organizations, and also medical schools that have a high density of uh, diversity amongst the AAMC. We actually started the USF Internal Medicine Night of Celebration as like a virtual second look. As uh, Dr. Aller had mentioned, you know, there's no 
thought process as far as going back into in-person interviews. So how do we kind of make a difference in the virtual land? Um, we were able to add on our final two groups. So our Asian, Middle Eastern and Pacific Islander affinity group, and then our women in medicine affinity group. And then now we're going to look in regards to uh, some efforts that we've been doing this past year. All right. So uh, more specifically here at the VA, we initiated our Embracing Diversity and Inclusion Lecture Series. A lot of it's run by our chief academic uh, residents in which we've been able to get a lot of different speakers that are kind of opening our mindset in regards to healthcare in different communities and populations. So stuff that may not be necessarily that you find in the textbook. Uh, we started this in June of last year with Pride Month and had different speakers. And every month we kind of look at different communities and kind of speak amongst that aspect. We're also able to do some in-person showcases in which we got the opportunity to meet some medical students and even pre-health um, mm -hmm. science students. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to sort of have that interaction and share our community and our efforts here in hopes to improve recruitment from underrepresented and underserved communities. We did a couple of them and uh, some of them are upcoming now in the spring. Um, we were able to send faculty to represent the GME at the GME level for USF, as well as some of our residents uh, were able to participate. And then as you've talked about the virtual showcases, something that we kind of came up with when I was an intern after coming off of the interview, the virtual interview trail, I kind of was like, there's a lot of efforts going on here that are not really showcased, like as you're, you know, virtually interviewing, as we mentioned. So the first year we did it sort of at the end of the interview season before um, applicants put in their rank list. And it was just a chance for us to talk about our, di our DICE team and also give uh, like the applicants one on one time with residents of different backgrounds. We had breakout rooms with people identifying from different things, including like mental health, like parents, how to raise kids um, and, and all the affinity groups. And then this year we kind of tweaked it and we did it earlier um, before applicants like start interviewing just to get more interest in the program, hopefully recruit or entice people to apply um, from diverse backgrounds. And we had over 250 people participate on that. And a lot of the um, applicants that are interviewed for both internal medicine and med peds, they uh, participated at, um, on the open house, which was great. So I'm not going to talk too much about affinity groups because we're going to have um, our wonderful residents um, speak about their own experiences. Um, but what are affinity groups? Affinity groups are a group of people that are comprised, in our case, by faculty, residents, fellows, and other individuals that um, want to join that have a, sh a com shared common experience, identity, or goal. And the idea is to create this safe space in which you can discuss pretty much anything that you want to and is uh, um, applicable or, or important to, to that groups in specific. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that. And then another fun initiative that we started this year was the resident spotlights on our social media Instagram page modeled after like the Vogue 73 questions. We just really wanted to highlight the diversity amongst our own like current residents and also like just showcase what Tampa has to offer, what the program has to offer. Um, it's just fun learning about each other, but also we get to share that with applicants, other programs and sort of keeps us current. Something also that we initiated this year is called Dice Day. Um, so it's super fun. Uh, anyone who went to USF for undergraduate or graduate school, we have something called Stampede of Service. So just kind of a nod in regards to that. You know, we look at all these different applicants. We look at all of you in regards to your profile. We see everything as first community service. And then we come here and then we say, okay, that's great. Get to work. So <laughs> we want to try to bring that back and really be a participant within our community. Um, and so this year we actually worked with Habitat for Humanity. It was super fun. Uh, we had two different groups, one group working with their Restore, which is kind of like their more consignment shop. And then we had another group that worked in uh, like their actual build. Um, and I'll be able to kind of show some pictures a little later. So we're hoping that each year we can maybe pick a different organization and work with them and then really try to get out and within our community and expand upon what we know other than health care and uh, medical needs. 
Um, and then this year, now that our the DICE group has grown so large, um, at the beginning of the year, we wanted to do like a kickoff, sort of like a welcome back, everybody meet up. Um, so in partnership with the Resident Wellness Committee, we did a picnic at Picnic Island um, on the beach. We had games, we had a potluck style, everybody brought families, pets. Uh, Dr. Paul also has a video of that to show you. Um, but it's just a nice way to get together, including like alumni and sort of, you know, see the, the um, progression of how DICE has grown. And then we're looking to uh, continue our efforts with the resident wellness uh, committee um, as we are getting ready to work on the karaoke send off. So hopefully within the next uh, few weeks or so, you guys should hear some more information about that. All right, we also like to work with our community and we realized that we did not have a pipeline for recruitment starting a lot earlier than medical school. So. We affiliated with the USF pre Scholar Program, which is a program for undergrad students from underrepresented and underserved um, uh, communities. And in collaborating with them, we have been able to do a bunch of different things. So one of the things that we have been able to do is really enhance the coaching and mentoring skills of our residents by helping these students really become the strongest applicants that they can be for graduate programs, including medical school. The other thing that we were able to accomplish is um, having more interest in staying in USF for medical school and hopefully subsequently for our um, residencies in pediatrics and medpeds and internal medicine. We also have been collaborating with the visiting students by doing a meet and greet in which they um, sort of get to have a break from working and talking about medicine. And this is more to get to know them at a personal level. It really helped us um, really uh, gauging the interest that they have in our residency program, but also really getting to know them at, at, at a more intimate level and seeing what they're all about, sharing our community. Some of these students um, were interested in uh, USF before from the academic standpoint. And after sort of meeting some of the residents and faculty members during this meet and greet, they sort of solidified that they really wanted to come here for residency, which is um, the idea of creating that pipeline. And then we also want to try to formulate a stronger bond with the Tampa Bay Street Medicine. So this is a group uh, that the College of Medicine uh, hosts um, and they're able to go out in the community and provide that care. We certainly have applicants every year who always talk and ask about the Tampa Bay Street Medicine. And so we, we certainly want to try to make that stronger pipeline in regards to that. And so, you know, as we spoke about a lot of these different initiatives throughout the few years and also things that we've been doing this year, you know, we really want to display and show that we're not just about talk or clickbait. This is not just to put something on the website. If anything, we don't really have anything on our website. Um, this is really who we are. We're very passionate in regards to diversity and inclusion. Uh, you can look at other programs, other places, and really kind of wonder what are they truly doing to try to foster that inclusion. Um, here you can kind of see uh, on our fall picnic, um, there's, if the video may be a little bit choppy, uh, but essentially you see all different types of people. Uh, you have alumni there, uh, families, uh, and so just having a great time in Tampa. Um, and, you know, we work hard and we do a lot for the hospitals, but can we go out and really and truly find some wellness? And then our, on the other side, uh, we have Ice Day um, where you can see some residents and also attendings going out, laying down sod. It was um, it was great um, fun. It was tough uh, later on. And at the end of the day, everybody was sore. Uh, <laughs> we had a lot of fun and they were extremely appreciative of the efforts that we were able to put. And actually one of the houses, we worked on two houses as far as like sodding. One of the houses went to a, a veteran here in, uh, in Tampa Bay. So it was really nice, especially for us who work at the VA to give back on that aspect. Absolutely. And the uh, consignment store, they worked really hard to moving a mm -hmm. lot of furniture. So we sort of went unprepared for how uh, physically <laughs> hard it was going to be, but it was very rewarding and we love engaging with our community. So moving on, um, I think that the best way to represent DICE is really uh, getting our community here and our residents um, are really the source of inspiration. So we're gonna have a couple of our residents. We're gonna have um, representing each affinity group. We're gonna have Leslie, Raphael, 
um, Cassie and Allison talking a little bit about their own experience. Hi everyone, I'm Leslie. I'm one of the third years and I'm a member of the Black and um, African American Affinity Group. So this group is uh, heralded by Dr. Paul. Um, I've been a member since my intern year and it's been um, sort of a great experience having, you know, um, community or creating community with people who sort of like share similar experiences from me or from, you know, self similar um, diverse background. So we have um, some pictures here. We've had some different activities over the year, the years. So we've had um, like a potluck thing done at Dr. Paul's house. This is from our um, um, resident retreat. Um, and it's just been great. So sort of connecting with resident fellows and faculty, it's um, been incredible. So sort of sharing these experiences, going on conferences, sort of traveling, connecting with different people. And, you know, as, as I've kind of um, exp uh, explored academic medicine and like met with people across the, um, just across the nation, I see that, you know, community is a big thing. And being able to sort of, as human beings, we kind of always draw ourselves to, you know, people who are like from us, similar backgrounds from us, and um, who, are sh who have shared experiences. So having USF have this experience, this, the past three years going through residency has been such of an incredible experience kind of connecting with people. And I know that, you know, the relationships we've built will like sort of last us a lifetime through this. So this is just, a, these are just pictures of our faculty members um, and members of this group. We have some videos as well, a lot of food, a lot of food and this one. yeah. So if you're interested in joining, we have a QR code here you can scan. Um, we're always welcoming and always looking for everyone um, to join with us. So, so Rafael is going to talk to us about the Latino, Hispanic, Spanish affinity group. Hey, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so, um, you know, diversity and inclusion is obviously very important to me. I do want to highlight a one of my most memorable memorable experiences in residency was actually admitting one uh, a patient, Spanish speaking patient that knew that she had metastatic cancer, um, but never really had like a tough course of care discussion. And she was like lying there in the ER. Um, people were just going to do a lot of procedures and things and being able to have a frank discussion with her understanding her culture her beliefs uh, what a latino family pressure is um, right because uh, i've experienced it myself latino pressure uh with the family they really want to do everything to try to keep patients alive as much as they can uh, but being able to understand her goals and swift like basically shift her um her management into a different way um, by understanding the patient. Um, I think it's something that we, as our DICE community, it's something that we want to increase. We want to understand our populations that we see here in Tampa, uh, for example. So with this group, you know, I've had the opportunity to share these experiences, right, with people that come from similar backgrounds as I do. Um, and not only I do, a lot of the patients that we see do. Um, so one of our faculty leads, our amazing Dr. Perez Colon, um, we have engaged in a couple of community activities. Most of them tend to be with DICE um, per se, but for example, one was the Latino Medical Student Association for which Dr. Perez Colon and Dr. Juan Enciso also went to, uh, being an important part of uh, residency recruitment to um, basically improve our diversity. Um, also having this night of celebration, all these things. Uh, and also I want to highlight community service opportunities. Um, personally, uh, USF Bridge is a community where we see a lot of uh, Latino, Latina community. Um, so being able to be a part of that has also been uh, very important. Um, and then social events, something that's very uh, ex tends to be a little bit more exclusive to the Latino side is the salsa night. Um, but obviously, we also have like dinners, house parties, happy hours. Um, and if any 
a buddy is interested in joining, you know, from the Latino community, Latina community, um, you can reach out to me, um, Carla, or even use the QR code. Awesome. <clears throat> and I'm Cassie, um, representing the LGBTQ plus group. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, who has been to like a pride parade, worn rainbow in June? Just raise his hand. Like, yeah, most people, right? Who's watching the call, hands. new seasons out on MTV, right? Um, so yeah, like we do, we're lucky enough that we do have like positive associations with our identity. We get to a whole month to celebrate per se. Um, but I think our group is similar to the other groups. It's nice to have that like decompression space, like a safe space to talk in our WhatsApp chat. Um, you know, a lot of like gender identity, sexual orientation is assumed. There's lots of microaggressions as there are for all of these different identities. Um, so I think that's a big part of our community, as everyone has said. Um, it's a place for us to talk about all the political taboo things that we try, tend to shy away from when talking with our patients when talking with our colleagues, especially in the state of Florida, especially nationally. I think I appreciate that our group sort of checks in every time a new like bill is passed. Um, we sort of like are like, hey, like, how's everybody feeling? Um, whether things are blocked or passed. Um, and I, I think a lot of uh, the things we talk about, too, keeps us very current, as Raphael was saying, about um, practices that are specific for our community of patients. Like, I know when monkeypox was a big thing here earlier in the year, Dr. Vega was, like, sending us all the updated guidelines, and we were talking about it, so we knew who should be screening, who should be getting the vaccine. We talk a lot about, like, transgender screening and access to care here. It's, that's been a big issue. Um, so it's just nice to, like, you know, remind ourselves to stay current on those things, makes us better doctors, um, you know, and also for ourselves to check in. And then I think, like, last year, our group has been really active in trying to, like, educate and, like, you know, share our knowledge and, like, you know, um, like, Jesse has been very vocal about his identity and also about, you know, educating, did a whole pronouns talk recently. Blake, as well, had a wonderful, like, transgender talk early in the year, Dr. Vega. Um, so I'm like really proud of our group. I think it's hard to do that. At anyone, it's hard to come up here and like, you know, be vulnerable. Um, and I think multiple members of our group feel very supported and are able to do that. Um, so it just makes me feel like really proud, like every day reminds me to like, you know, be proud, still have fun, but also keep working towards this like greater goal and bridging health disparities, um, which I think we have a lot of ideas to do. And this is where it starts. So and also join our group if you're interested. <laughs> A lot of great stuff. Oh, yeah, that's just the end. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Allison. I'm one of the PGY2s, um, and I am honored to be able to represent our women in medicine group. It's called FEMINIM. Um, so this group was started last year and really just serves as a supportive community for you know, women in medicine. It's run by women in medicine. Um, it's for residents, interns, fellows, faculty, attendings you know, just a safe space for us to come together to talk about issues that, you know, women uniquely face in medicine um, and kind of have a supportive community to discuss those things as well as even sometimes come up with solutions to um, address, you know, some of those things that we might be experiencing. Um, so we really like to foster dialogue about, you know, some of those unique challenges that women face, uh, whether that's talking about, hey, I'm on my period, I don't have tampons. Does anybody have one that's at TGH or, hey, um, you know, the sexist thing really happened to me today and I, I just want someone to discuss it with. Or I think the discussion in our group chat last night was, hey, does anybody know like a good OB guy that I can go to? So just, you know, ways for us to communicate and to help each other out um, when we're kind of all in a very difficult program and stressful situations. Um, and I think one of the things we really like to talk about is opportunities for, you know, our community for females in medicine to engage with each other, to talk with each other, um, to have mentorship, uh, which is why we need more faculty members and fellows, fellows as well. We'd love to have you guys uh, just to serve as, you know, people that we can look up to or talk to when we have issues going on. And I think that a great example of this is we had a we had a potluck, uh, yeah, Christmas potluck, um, where one of our members kind of brought up an issue that they were facing, um, and this was um, brought to the attention of one of our faculty members that was in our group, and it was actually addressed. And I think they came to a good. Um, resolution based on that. So, you know, we really do want to help our members be seen, be heard, and make sure that, you know, they're being treated appropriately. Um, you know, we've done some fun things. We do potlucks, we've done some breweries, uh, we've done a wine bar. We actually went to see the Barbie movie together, which was a ton of fun. 
Um, so we want to keep doing these kind of events. We actually have our next event is uh, February 15th. Um, it is from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Brass Tap um, in Carroll. It's going to be a trivia night. That'll be a lot of fun. Uh, we'd love for you guys to join us. And those are our QR codes. Uh, please feel free to you know join it or talk to any one of the women in the program. We'd you know we'd love to have you and uh, discuss things with you. Absolutely, and you can uh, you can be part of multiple affinity groups. Okay, this is not like a once and done uh, type situation. So, um, speaking about the future, what do we want to do in the future? We want to expand the footprint of our community. We want to have more people getting involved with dyes. We want to have uh, more involvement with our community. So there is a couple of things that we're doing. We um, have created some more affinity groups. We started an Asian Pacific Islander and um, Indian affinity group. So if anyone is interested, we also have that QR code that we can provide to you. We are um, in talks about starting an affinity group for family during residency, having family during residency and sort of helping each other and providing that sense of community and support uh, with this very specific situation that not everyone is going through. Um, we also want to have more alumni involvement. So if you know of someone who will be a great mentor for any of these groups, you can contact any of us and uh, we'll be happy to get them in contact with the right group um, with share experiences. Uh, we also want to um, incorporate leadership from the residency standpoint for each year. So we had Cassie was our resident co-chair. She was absolutely amazing this past year. So big shoes to fill, uh, but we're going to have a PGY 1, 2, and 3 residency co-chair this upcoming year. So stay tuned for applications and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun together, create community, continue to build these relationships that we have been able to in the last couple of years. And we're really looking forward to the future. So any questions, comments, reactions, ideas, we welcome everything. We want to create a great pipeline. We want to create a great, great sense of community and belonging. So please do come to us with all of these. And there is a lot of pictures of the co-shares and our families that are having fun um, in the Tampa Bay area and, and, and all over the world, really. Um, so we love every single one of you and we want you to be a really important part of our community. So please do join and um, come and talk to us if you have any questions, ideas or anything else. Yeah, as Dr. Press Clone said, we truly want to thank you all for taking the time and opportunity to listen to us and everything that we've done in regards to like dice uh, throughout the last few years. And this is something that we're truly passionate about and we really want to make a difference within our program and also within our community that we serve. So uh, thank you once again. How to stop sharing. <clears throat> and we are right on time. So I don't know if anybody has a question or two. If not, that's okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Aller. I have to run, but thank you for Dr. Aller, Dr. Perez Cologne, Dr. Paul, and all the residents who just and just outstanding. Just the richness of this program really has come through in this presentation. So thank you for your leadership, Kelly, because it all starts with the program director, and we are so proud of you. I know a lot of the faculty here have seen you since you were uh, a baby medical student. We're very oh. proud of all your accomplishments and. This program is a reflection of your leadership and of your vision. So thank you so much. It's a village. It takes a village. And so thank you everybody for being a part of that village. Bye.